And I'm going to talk about really kind of three things. I'm going to talk about genetics in the context of race and ethnicity, and then use examples from my own work, from the Gala study, and then kind of talk about some of the problems when you study racially mixed populations. Problems, but then also some of the advantages. And so it's really kind of three talks all into one. So please feel free to wave your hand as I'm going through this. And just to put this in the right context, this has been an incredibly, incredibly controversial topic. I mention it and people go bonkers. People get really mad at me or they love me. There's no in between, say it's all or none. So there are many folks that say that there are no differences between groups. Absolutely no. We're 99.9% .9 the same. That's one camp. But then there's a whole other group that says, well, there's some differences and we should look at them. And there's no in between. No one says, well, maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong, maybe together we're both right. Okay. So I'll just say that we are 99.9% .9 the same, but we also are 98.9% .9 the same as a chimpanzee. Some of us are closer to that 98.9% .9 than others. <laughs> so you guys can figure that out. <laughs> But let me just start. So I took advantage of going second with Kenny. And uh, I made this quick slide. And this is to just kind of give you the, the view from 10,000 feet up of what's involved in a study. You have to have the idea. You have to have a good idea that gets funded. Then you got to write a grant. You got to get funded. Okay. And then there's the idea behind recruitment. You got to get patients. And that's not an easy task. But that's where it helps to have physicians or clinicians involved. Then you have to do what we call phenotyping, which is a characterization. So what kind of disease are you studying? So is it, is it going to be cancer? Is it going to be lung cancer? There's lots of different types of lung cancer, so you've got to narrow it down. And then what about the lung cancer? Are you just going to look at cells or tissues from the lung cancer? Or are you going to look at the development of lung cancer? So these are all the physical characteristics that go into what are called phenotyping. And then you got to get DNA or the sample that you're studying. And you know, when you're a young investigator, you just you don't have time to be sitting there and storing samples. You got to go to a bank, like where you put your money, Bank of America, at least that's where I go. Bank of America, you've got to make a deposit. So there's a whole DNA banking issue. And you don't want some guy that has a million little piggy banks. You want someone that standardizes everything, that has some credibility, that can keep track of all the records, of all the deposits and withdrawals. So that's what Kenny had alluded to, standardization. And then you want someone that knows the genetic analysis. Well, when you're dealing with thousands of samples and they get put on a little plate, they all look the same. So things get automated, they get barcoded. And when you got thousands of plates, you want someone to be able to, if a plate falls on the floor, you want to be able to pick it up, say, scan the barcode, say, okay, I know exactly where this goes. That's the standardization that Kenny talks about. And that's, this is what Kenny does. Kenny's great right here. It's exactly what he does. I also started this. This is what we're very good at. And I started the recruitment. I had to get help. We brought in a crew of folks that just simply do statistical analysis. They're like the CPAs of genetics. They just sit there at the computer and do the analysis, things that I can't do. And, they, and they're critical to this pipeline. And then here I am. I come back in, look at the analysis, and interpret it all, and then write the papers for us as a group to be successful. But the point that I'm trying to make is that, that there's not a single individual in this pipeline that's more important than any other individual. And everybody is critical in this pipeline. So it really, it takes a team, or to use a cliche, it takes a village to make a good project. And that's where we're at today with respect to genetic studies. The day of a cottage industry where an individual investigator worked in a lab by him or herself is gone. We're talking about large scale projects, and that takes a team effort. So recognizing that not all of you understand a lot about genetics, I wanted to just explain some of the terminology I'm going to use. A candidate gene is a gene that makes biologic sense for disease. So for asthma, 
a gene that makes good sense is interleukin-4. That's just because we know it's about its biologic behavior and that genetic variation in that gene could change the way that gene behaves and therefore may play a role in the disease. So Kenny had mentioned about genetic variants. Well, we all have the same genes. Every single one of us has the same gene. However, there are different flavors of genes. And what makes those different flavors are what we call alleles. Now, what makes a different flavor of a gene? That's called genetic variation. Your gene number seven, even though I have gene number seven, may be a little bit different because you may have some variants in gene seven that I don't have. That makes that you have a different allele for seven than I do. Now, these variants can come in a million different forms. There could be SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And if you made the analogy of a gene and a word, like a letter word, so for example, the word bear, B-E-A-R. Your mind, you hear bear, you think of a furry creature, right, in the woods. What if there's a misspelling in that word and it went from B-E-A-R to B-E-E-R? The interpretation that you have in your mind is very, very different, right? That's a SNP. That's a subtle genetic variant. And the way that you interpret it can result in a disease. The way your body interprets a gene, it sees a different misspelling, can cause a completely different set of instructions. The same thing is for the cystic fibrosis gene. You have the cystic fibrosis gene, I have it, but we don't have the mutation that causes cystic fibrosis. So when an individual that suffers from cystic fibrosis, when their body reads that gene, they make a mutant protein that doesn't work well. So that's all it is, just a subtle misspelling. And then you have other misspellings, kind of people write term papers and they cut and paste. Maybe they cut and paste too much. So this might be a repeat section. It goes and, 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 okay? And then also there's artificial insertions where you may have an and in the middle of a word, but then your interpretation of that word changes because it's gibberish. So that's genetic variation. That's how I look at it. When we talk about haplotypes, haplotypes are simply just sentences. So if you can imagine the gene being a word, the combination of several words makes a sentence, and that's what we would call a haplotype. And a whole sentence would travel together, like see, Joe, run. That would be considered a haplotype. Okay, so let me get to... In the world of genetics, there are really two kinds of ways that we look at it. There are simple disorders, and then there are complex disorders. Simple disorders are disorders that tend to arise from single gene mutations. Cystic fibrosis is a good one. One gene, one mutation, one disease. These tend to be pretty rare. CF is rare. Um, they tend to occur in homogeneous populations. CF is a Caucasian disorder. Um, they tend to run in families. You know when people that have CF, their parents likely have members of their families that also had CF because it's a recessive disorder. Other disorders are what we call complex. These are disorders that not, do not result from one gene but the combination of several, several genes. And they also tend to have strong environmental components. Asthma is one of them. There's not one asthma gene. There's lots of them. And the genes differ by their interface or interaction with environmental factors. They tend to be common, these disorders. They tend to have large public health burdens. Uh, in the U.S., one in 10 kids has asthma. That's a pretty big, pretty big disease. They tend to occur in a variety of prevalences in different populations. And, and for asthma, in, in at least, there are lots of health disparities. Yeah.